Hello and welcome into Big Ten Today. Happy Friday. Glad to have you here. I'm Kylan Mills. The wait is over, at least for the most part. The final four weekend is officially here. Purdue going to be taking on NC State. We'll get you ready for that matchup in just a little bit. But it all starts tonight with two of the biggest superstars in women's college basketball taking center stage as Iowa's Caitlin Clark faces UConn's Paige Beckers. That's today's big story. UConn has won 13 straight. Iowa has won 10 straight coming into this final four showdown. The Huskies coming off a convincing win over freshman sensation Juju Watkins in second seed. USC. The Hawkeyes have proven they can win in a variety of ways, most recently knocking off the defending national champion LSU Tigers. It all comes down to UConn and Iowa at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse tonight. The Hawkeyes back in the final four for the second straight season. Justine Fernandez, Steph White, and Christy Winter Scott are in Cleveland with what the postseason success means for Lisa Bluter's program. Well, hello, Kylan from downtown Cleveland. We are just blocks from Rocket Mortgage in the public square area where tonight we will see the Hawkeyes taking on the legacy that is Gino Oriama and the Yukon Huskies. And first ladies, I think we have to appreciate what it takes to get here and yes. for Iowa, what it takes to get here back to back. Well, when you have a back to back opportunity, Lisa Bluter said yesterday, she said, listen, last year, everything was new. We had so many off court obligations and all of that. And their wide eyes were kind of embracing that moment. But this year, it's a business trip and they understand the assignment. They know about what they have to do. But now with the extra added experience, bringing back 11 players who experienced the final four last year, I mean, it bodes well because now it's not a shock to the system. Their eyes aren't as wide and they can get straight to business. Well, it takes remarkable consistency. And when I think about this Iowa program, I think about when Lisa Bluter took over. Now, she is she is a coach who laid the foundation a long time ago for this program to be ready when it comes time to, to getting to back to back final four. She hasn't compromised in her values in her core values. She continues to recruit the same types of players that fit her system and, and, and continues to, to to lay the foundation. It doesn't hurt that you get a player like Caitlin Clark certainly <laughs> to stay home and to come sure. in and to play. But it also takes a little bit of luck. Mm -hmm. You got to get the right draw in the tournament. You've got to stay healthy. And this is an Iowa Hawkeye team that, that last year and this year, those two things have have been remarkable. Yeah, first Big Ten team to be on this stage in back-to-back -back years, and I think we have to go to the matchup. I, I know so many people are anticipating this. Yeah. We know the eyeballs that that Elite Eight matchup got. What are you looking for in this matchup? Well, this matchup is going to be very intriguing because you have a short bench for UConn, but at the same time, the pace of play is going to be a major key that I'm going to be looking for because when you're looking at this Iowa team, they average over 90 points a game, right? They want to push pace. And you see UConn, they average over 80, so it's not like they play in a slow manner. But Gino Ariema said, we want to play fast, but just not as fast as Iowa. So how are they going to do that? They're going to break that down and probably shoot late in the shot clock and use that offense as their defense and take possessions away from Iowa. So number one, they can stay out of foul trouble, right? Because they're giving up less possessions. And number two, they can utilize that clock and get great shots, get into your first or second actions with 10 seconds or less on the shot clock. I love offense. And I, I am and so, not afraid to say I'm it. not afraid to say <laughs> it. So I am, yeah. I am, I am intrigued with pace of play, yeah. number one, uh, shot making, number two, and both of these teams that that share the basketball really yes. work to get to get the best shot on the floor, passing up good shots for great shots, a lot of ball movement, player movement, free flowing type of offense. So I'm really looking forward to this. I think we have two of the best offensive teams in the country going at it. So I know we yeah. want to talk defense, but I want to talk no, offense. I want to talk offense too, but I want to see who, stop, who can stop it. Who can stop it? That's going to be the and real key. And tell me what makes this UConn team difficult? They've won 29 yeah. of their last 31. They've been here year after year after year. Yeah, I think it's Paige Beckers, right? She makes everyone better the same way Caitlin Clark makes everyone better better for the team and I think the synergy between her and Aaliyah Edwards on the interior they just have great chemistry and sometimes it's not just Paige downstairs to Edwards it's Edwards taking a, a cut from Paige and feeding her inside so I think they have great reads with one another and they balance the floor out but I think they understand their roles I mean you have freshmen in the starting lineup with Shade and Arnold and they are not afraid of anything and they know what they need to do to star in their role and they've been executing that's why they're here I think the other piece is you know this team is has 
been resilient. It's a team that's that's had to to reinvent themselves multiple times throughout the course of the year. That's been knocked down. Um, that's gotten back up. You've had young players who have who have probably exceeded expectations early, who were maybe brought in to do a couple of different things, and, and now that their role has been expanded and stepping up to the challenge. And so when you have a team that's been through what they've been through, um, you put yourself in position when there's low expectations relative to what Connecticut is used to having, right. Uh, right. And, and you get to this point. Now the expectation is to win a national championship because that's what the UConn Huskies' expectations are every year. So, you know, I think this team has learned a lot about themselves. They play within themselves, and they position themselves mm -hmm. now to compete for a national championship. Yeah, we know what a powerful unifying force going through adversity is. We see that time and time again across sports. We have not talked about coaching in this matchup <laughs> yet. You have Gino Oriyama, yeah. has 11 championships, yeah. versus Lisa Bluter, who you talked about, really starting to build some consistency and a legacy of her own. Well, it's magnificent to watch these two in their craft and master what they have been able to do. And I was up in stores for rounds one and two, and I was sitting in the shooting practices and the practices for UConn, and I had my pen and paper out. I mean, I'm always learning, but he is such a great teacher of the game. And it's not just always doing the same thing every time. It's like, okay, this is the order of things, but then, hey, let's try this too. Here's a little extra wrinkle because obviously at this juncture, you're gonna be scouted. So people are gonna take away some things, but he has counters for the counters for the counters. <laughs> and I was just learning and just mesmerized by how he was teaching the game, but also how effective he was with teaching it because of the way it was executed. I think one of the things that stands out to me about these two um, and, and the longevity of their careers is there are two coaches who have never divvied away from their core values. Right. When they're bringing players into the program, it is about do these players fit our culture? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in the, the way that the landscape in college sport has changed, to, to be someone who doesn't compromise your core values, I, I think is, is incredible. And to be able to do that with remarkable consistency. The second piece is their ability to adjust to the way that the game has, has changed. Yes. To, to offensively open up the floor, to give, give freedom to the, the versatility and the, and the, and the, and the skill sets of today's players, yes. right? To defensively think outside the box and, and continue to, to stay ahead of the curve and, and be students of the game. You know, the greatest coaches are able to, to stay true to who they are, yet adapt to the changing times, and these are two of the best. I mean, we talk about some of those defensive assignments for a moment. You have Nika Mule, who has won consecutive defensive Big East Player of the Year. She has a tough assignment at Caitlin Clark. Right. Then you have Gabby Marshall. We've seen some yeah. of the defensive stops she comes up with in crunch time taking on Paige Beckers. Yeah, I mean, guards win in the postseason, and it's not just offensively, right? But we love offense, and we get that. But at the same time, you got to lock down and take things away, right? you got to take people out of their comfort zones, make things uncomfortable, make shots difficult. Every shot has to be contested. Every catch, ha you have to be up underneath people. So I think there's got to be a level of pride and a level of just consistent effort when it comes to being great defensive players. But I want to see how well they can sustain their level of defensive focus. One of the things about defending superstars is it always takes five people on the defensive <laughs> end. So one person has the matchup, right? But all, for all everybody has to be beyond this and guys it's snowing on us right now they like this conversation about this. mother they like nature does <laughs> see what they think sometimes about defense it, right here sometimes it snows no, in April. but 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 i do um i i do think that individual matchup and being able to guard one-on-one. -on -one. When you get forced into rotations against these two teams, they make you pay. So Gabby Marshall containing Paige Beckers. I expect Paige Beckers to look to post her up a little bit, uh, certainly on the offensive end of the floor. And when you think about Nika Mule and Caitlin Clark, there's always going to be two bodies on Caitlin Clark. Now it's mm -hmm. making the right play. Last but not least, your X Factor. My X Factor in this game is going to be who can out-execute whom. And I think when you have two great disciplined teams, it's going to come down to Paige Beckers, and it's going to come down to Caitlin Clark because Caitlin Clark, she apprises 65 points, right, from either scoring or assisting. So I think whoever can make the entire team better, that team will win. My X Factor is Sydney Falter. Her ability to come in and knock down threes and be a terrific defensive rebounder is going to be key for the Hawkeyes. Well, luckily, Kylan, basketball is an indoor sport, so we're going to go warm up for a minute, but we have plenty more to talk about when it comes to this Final Four matchup. But for now, I'll send it back to you.
man, the ladies got the short end of the stick in terms of the assignment. They should be out west tonight. Make sure you tune into the Big Ten Live Final Four pregame, which starts at 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 o'clock Central, including coverage from Chile, Cleveland, and breakdowns of the UConn-Iowa matchup. That's tonight at 6 Eastern here on the Big Ten Network and the Fox Sports app. Experience goes a long way this time of year. Of the men's Final Four teams, UConn is the only school that's been this far in the last 40 years. NC State and Purdue are making their first Final Four appearances since the 80s. Alabama here for the first time ever. With the win, the Boilers could dance into the title game for the first time since 1969. With the way they're playing, the Boilers seem to be poised to do that. Purdue is just two wins away from the program's first national title. The stage is set and the stakes are high at State Farm Stadium out in Glendale, Arizona. And that's where we find the Big Ten Network's own Dave Revson, Bruce Weber, and Andy Katz. Kylan, thanks. Great to be here in Glendale. Dave Revson, Bruce Weber, and Andy Katz. The day before we tip things off in what should be a fabulous Final Four, guys. Have to love the way this Final Four is composed. You've got Purdue and UConn, number one in 12 of the 20 weeks in the AP poll this year. So probably the two best teams in college basketball. I think Houston was in that discussion somewhat this year as well. You have Alabama, who was the highest scoring team in the country during the regular season. And then NC State, who's been an amazing story here, winning nine straight elimination games to get here. What do you think of this grouping of four teams? Well, first you got the two guys that are supposed to be here. And obviously Purdue's here. I got my golden blackout. I got my Purdue ring. I'm ready to go. I finally, there's only one Big Ten team. I can support them this time. Was there a long time. But UConn and Purdue have been consistent. They, everyone thought they should be here, and they're here. But the, the magic of the ma March Madness, NC State, that's what it's about. It's just amazing. I watched two of their games last night, and they are playing at a high level. And Alabama, they are in inter entertaining. They're going to have some fun. They're going to jack up those threes. And if they're going in, they can beat anybody. So great storylines. You've got UConn trying to go back-to-back -back for the first time since Florida in 06 07. Purdue, the redemption, trying to pull a Virginia, 18-19 now, 23-24 after losing to a 16 last year. NC State. Not here since 83, also in the Southwest. That was Albuquerque versus Phoenix. And Alabama never being here before. Never, which is kind of crazy with the Final Four. But in talking to the players and coaches the last couple of days, with Purdue and UConn locked in, saw it. They are not being overwhelmed. We'll see what happens on Saturday. But by the moment, UConn obviously trying to repeat. Even the guys that weren't on the team, like a Cam Spencer, they're locked in. Purdue, they, I feel like from, a, from day one last year, they've been trying to get to this moment. But with NC State and Alabama, those players, a lot of guys that transferred up, they've got some wow here, like cannot believe I'm here. And that may overtake them on Saturday. If they don't get off to good starts, either one of them, I think it could be an early night for Alabama and NC State. Well, I'm interested to kind of go down that road a little bit, not necessarily just with those two programs, but overall. I mean, you coach in a Final Four, you coach in a national championship game, so you certainly know about the vastness of this event and, and how it can overwhelm teams give people some insight into what's going on right now with each of these four teams because there is so much ancillary stuff that leads up to these games well it's just huge as a coach obviously we come every year you know it's our convention and you you have the parties the clinics the meetings all that but now you're here so it's like oh my goodness you know this is and you talked about it, nca moment figuring out that i'm in the final four but the preparation I, you know, I when I found out we, when we won, we knew we were in. I called coaches that have been here. I called Tom Izzo. I called Lou Olson, who we had beaten that time. I called Jim Cahill. How do you handle it? And it's so, so important, the travel, getting there. We just saw UConn had an issue. Purdue came the night before. I think also you want to get out of town because if you stay in town, everybody's bugging you. So now they can get away. They can focus on the team tickets you cannot imagine what it's like i talked to matt painter on monday night he goes i'm doing my tickets i had to talk to doug elgin from the missouri valley i said doug i need 50 more tickets because they were hosting the thing in st louis so it makes it really difficult all that preparation is important so obviously you kind of have the plane issue they chose for whatever reason to not depart connecticut until wednesday late they didn't get here till wee hours of the morning on thursday and in, they still met their media obligations. I think just the staff's going to be tired. You know, Dan Hurley, everyone else, because they're going to be up watching tape and all that. I felt like the players yesterday were not that tired. They'll have plenty of time to rest. They'll get out here with the open practice. They'll have a regular practice. They did practice yesterday. And there is the second game. So they're not playing till what, 6.30-ish uh, 
you know, or so Saturday. So I think they'll have plenty of time. But I do think the coaches will be tired after their travel. Right. And you mentioned the open practice, but there's obviously the open practice is for show and fans can go. You were telling me 35,000 fans when yes, you yes. when you brought Illinois to St. Louis, which obviously makes sense. But how about all the other stuff that's going on that, that the fans don't see? You still got to keep your normal preparation. It's so, so important. And, you know, whether it's your scouting reports, your film work, but also getting to a gym. You got to find gyms because you got to practice. You got to do your walkthroughs, all that stuff. So you all your staff has to do their job and it's got to be as normal as possible. Well, I would just say this, that I also say the best player has to be locked in. And with Purdue, we have seen that with Zach Eady. Look, he's not going to give you great sound bites. He's not going to give us great sound bites. Uh, And yet he has been absolutely focused on one goal, which is to win the national championship. Well, well done there, Andy, because we're going to take a deep dive into Purdue and Zach Eady coming up in just a little bit as we continue our coverage of the Final Four from Glendale. But for now, let's send it back to Kylan in Chicago. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Purdue, they've gotten quite the accomplishments knocked off this season. First Final Four appearance since 1980. Most wins in a season in program history. Most conference wins in a season in school history. Six wins against AP Top 10 teams, which is tied for the most in the Big Ten in the last 15 seasons. Now, can they do it all and win the national crown? Welcome back into Big Ten Today, and I'm joined now by the former Boiler, Ray Fell Davis, to dive more into this NC State-Purdue matchup. But I want to start by talking about how the Boilers got to this point. Mm -hmm. In these four NCAA tournament wins, they've combined for 85 points. That's the margin of victory. They've been so impressive, and it hasn't just been Zach Eady. Yes, he's been dominant, but you look at some of the contributions from Fletcher Lawyer, 14 points against Tennessee, Braden Smith, 14 points, 15 assists a game before against Gonzaga. What has impressed you most about the way this team is playing right now? The way they've been able to win in multiple ways. They've been able to win games that they had to grind it out against Tennessee, a tough, ugly rock fight. They were 3 of 15 from the three-point line, but they took care of the glass. They took care of the basketball. Zach Eady was dominant. Fletcher Lawyer scored the basketball in other ways outside of just making threes. Brandon Smith's ability to control the pace of games, whether they want to play fast or they want to play in the half court, that's really impressed me. But then just the ability for those guys to stay together. You see Ethan Morton against Gonzaga. He was uncertain to that first half just to foul. This is a fifth-year senior that had high expectations coming into this lineup. And he was inserted to foul. He got his two fouls and went right back to the bench. And he was cheering. He was still happy for that <laughs> moment for his teammates. And normal teams, a lot of teams in the country, they just don't have that. They don't have a locker room that's together, that's balled in on the same goal. Rather guys play two minutes, rather they play 20 minutes. You look at a guy like Cam Heidi, he's just been ready for his moment. I just love the togetherness of this team and the way they've been able to win in different ways. Just three made triples for the best three-point shooting team in the country in Purdue's matchup against Tennessee. They're still able to find a way to win, in large part due to Zach Eady's 40 points, but it just goes to show, to your point, they can win in a variety of ways. Now, this Purdue team has not been to a Final Four in 40-plus years, as we just pointed out. However, they've shown up in the biggest moments this season. Purdue undefeated against ranked teams in 2023-2024, which is crazy, right? I mean, how can that experience pay dividends in this Final Four? Uh, Let them know that they can play with anybody. It gives them the confidence, especially those guards, those younger players. It lets you know that we are in the game no matter who we play. I mean, you look at it. They beat six Sweet 16 teams, and they swept Illinois. So, Illinois was in the Elite Eight, and they beat six top 10 ranked teams this season. It gives the guys the confidence that they can play with anybody they step on the floor with. They're not afraid of the moment. They've played in tournaments. You think the Maui Invitational. They play Alabama out in Canada. So they've been in pressure situations before. They got down 11 points versus Tennessee, a team that can put you away. And they fought back, took that lead in that first half. And that's when they won the game. They've won games with their offense. They've won games with their defense. They're together in a locker room. I like where this team is. I heard what Coach Payne said to the guys the other day before the game. Only team that can beat Purdue right now are the guys in Purdue's locker room. Purdue's going to beat Purdue if Purdue makes an early exit out of this Final Four. Well, that's fair. However, there is something very scary about a team that's playing with nothing to lose, and that's exactly what you get in NC State. They have now won nine straight elimination games. I mean, that's just an all-time great Cinderella run that will go down in the history books. 
However, when you look at this NC State team, the personnel, the tactics, what presents the toughest challenges for Purdue? Yeah, shout out to NC State. I've actually been a quiet NC or a loud NC State fan <laughs> okay. all season long. My little cousin is on a team, number one, Jaden Taylor. So he presents a challenge off of the bench. He's a guard. He can score the ball. He can make shots from deep. But when you look at NC State, I know we've talked a lot about DJ Burns, the personality. He's big. He's joyful. He can dominate on the block. But Zach Eady isn't Kyle Filipowski. And I know Zach Eady, mm-hmm. his weight down there, what he brings defensively on the interior, that's going to be a matchup that you got to watch out for. DJ Burns is not going to bully Zach Eady. I'm not worried about any of that. So when I look at NC State, I look at a guy, DJ Horn, that no one's giving attention to right now. A guy that scored over 2,000 points in his career, can score at all three levels. And that win against Marquette, DJ Burns struggled. He struggled against the interior defense that Marquette presented, only four points. It was DJ Horn that carried the load. He can go for 20, 25 points in the game. So if it's a game where DJ Burns is double-double doing his work down low, DJ Horn is dominating the perimeter, getting to the basket, scoring at will. And then you get guys like O'Connell, guys like Casey, guys like my cousin Jaden Taylor. If they hit shots from deep, that's what's going to present trouble for, for Purdue. And then North Carolina, I know they're going to try to pressure Purdue, going to try to trap them, going to try to press them, going to try to turn them over. So Purdue can't have one of those games where they miss shots and they turn the ball over on top of North Carolina guards making shots. North Have you Carolina ever seen State. that meme, the famous NBA photo, where Carl Anthony Towns is trying to back up Boogie Cousins, and Boogie's <laughs> just, like, standing there like, good luck with that. Yes. That's what I think of with this DJ Burns yes. Zach Eady matchup. <laughs> Zach Eady is 300 pounds of man, and Come he on, is man. strong. <laughs> you, know, you know that photo I'm talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah. that kind of pops to mind because you point out the bully ball Burns has been playing. Like, he's not going to back up no. a 7'4", 300 pounds Zach Eady. So that footwork that DJ Burns has is going to be put to the test. Still, though, you like Zach Eady in that matchup, right? Oh, yeah, no doubt. I like Zach Eady in any big man matchup on the block. Zach Eady's not a guy that's going to go for head fakes. You're not going to get him with the fancy footwork. You're going to have to score over Zach Eady. And at 7-4 with that wingspan, I like him down low. I think DJ Burns is a load. I think he can really score the ball. I think his passing ability in this game is going to be key because scoring over size down low, especially a guy in Zach Eady where he just doesn't foul you. He just uses his size the right way. I can remember trying to play Isaac Haas one-on-one, and he's just like a little <laughs> kid. So even though DJ Burns is what that size, Zach Eady, Zach Eady's the man down there. All right, Rafael, thanks. We'll check back in with you in just a bit. But up next here on Big Ten Today, we'll head back out to Cleveland, where our Big Ten Network crew has the keys for Iowa to knock off the winningest program in women's college basketball. Today's Big Stat is brought to you by Gatorade. The lights are bright in the NCAA tournament, and the stars have shined even brighter. UConn's Paige Beckers has been stellar this postseason, averaging 28 points, 9 rebounds, and 5 assists per game. Iowa's Caitlin Clark also putting up some pretty ridiculous numbers, 32-plus points, 7-plus boards, and 10 assists per game. These two are really going to be fiery when they take center stage tonight. Well, who will lead their team to the promised land that is the national title game? Tip-off just hours away at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. Let's send it back to Justine Fernandez, Steph White, and Christy Winter-Scott, who are in Cleveland with a Final Four preview. Back from downtown Cleveland to talk this Final Four matchup a bit more. Let's start with Iowa. Aside from Caitlin Clark, what else do they have and how does that pose problems for UConn? Oh, they have a lot. Number one, they lead the country in scoring for a reason. Caitlin Clark's not averaging 92 points a game. Okay, she's averaging 32, which is no slouch, but she has a lot of help. Kate Martin is going to be the glue that she is in this game. They know that this is their last go round. That's going to give them the extra firepower and the extra energy. And Gabby Marshall, let's go. Hannah Stokey, let's go. We've seen it from them all year. Stokey went for 47 points earlier this year. So we understand that she can go off too. So I think it's going to be a balanced attack. I think Caitlin Clark is going to be the straw that stirs the drink, as she always is. I mean, she had 15 assists. She had 12 assists. I mean, she is making things happen on the floor. And she accounts for 65 points, either scoring or assisting for her teammates. So I think it's going to be a unified attack. Yeah, and, and I think when you think about UConn and outside of anyone other than, than Paige Becker, certainly you have to start with Leah Edwards on the interior. I mean, she is she is going to be you know, a, probably a top six draft pick mm-hmm. in the WNBA draft. Uh, but to me, when you play Iowa, it comes down to can you match them from the three-point line? Uh-huh. So Ashlyn Shade. 
KK Arnold, can they knock down enough threes to keep up right. with the Kate Martins and the Gabby Marshalls mm -hmm. and the Sydney Falters in addition to the Caitlin Clark? Yeah, who had three in the she last did. time that we saw her. Yes. And if we think about the last time we saw this Iowa team taking on LSU, you had Kate Martin in double figure, figure Sydney Falter in double figures. Mm -hmm. How much will they need that supporting cast in order to beat the Huskies? Well, they don't have Molly Davis, and we don't know if she's going to be able to play or not in the final four, but listen. Sydney Falter is ready to go. Sixth player of the year in the Big Ten Conference this year for a reason. And Jan Jensen, the assistant coach, she said, listen, she knows that this is her moment to step up. She's ready. And she's in the locker room telling them, I'm ready. Whatever you need me to do, I can do it for the team. And she's done it in a consistent manner. And I just love that. You know, she, she doesn't have to prepare herself. She's already ready to go. Yeah, I, I think that the star matchup is what everybody wants to see mm -hmm. and and certainly what what all of us want to see as well <laughs> yeah. but it's going to come down to the supporting cast it's going to come down to uh offensively who else can put the put the ball in the hole we're talking about two of the premier offensive teams in the country so yes defense is going to be a part of it can you disrupt can you take them out of their rhythm because they're both offensive uh, teams that, that that really thrive with rhythm and ball movement mm -hmm. and spacing but which supporting cast steps up and, and gives the superstars the most help. Maybe last but not least, we know that these March Madness games tend to go down to the very last minute, yes. oftentimes the very last seconds. Yes. Who has the edge when it turn and when it comes to play down the stretch? Oh, we've seen it happen for both teams, right? We saw UConn have a real stretch of a, a time at the end of their game against Syracuse, and KK Arnold came up with a huge triple with less than a minute to go to take it to a six-point lead. So it could be anybody, right? I think both teams are well prepared. They understand their assignments when it comes down to execution. And it comes down to time and score situations. They're very well versed in that. But I mean, I, I would like to see the basketball in the hands of Caitlin Clark and, and Paige Beckers in those moments. But at the same time, they don't necessarily have to be the ones to score the ball in those moments. So that's going to be intriguing to watch as well. Yeah, I think when you talk about two teams who have built trust with their teammates, right, who, who understand uh, big moments and execution in big moments. And you have two of the premier uh, shot makers and playmakers in the women's basketball game and Caitlin Clark and Paige Beckers. And those are two players who most of the time make the right plays. And sometimes it's scoring, sometimes it's facilitating, but also two of the best coaches when after timeout execution and which actions you're getting mm -hmm. to and misdirections. And so for, for somebody who loves X's and O's, I think, you know, this is going to be a fun matchup uh, from the start of the game to the end of the game. Yes. High scoring matchup or defensive matchup? I think it's going to be somewhere in between. I don't know if it's going to be in the 90s and 80s. I think it's going to be in the 70s or 60s, high 60s, because I think both teams are going to be mm -hmm. doing their due diligence on the defensive end. But I also think that both teams are going to want to get up and down. But Gino said he didn't want to go that fast. So we'll see if they can minimize the possessions for Iowa. I'm taking the over. It's going to be high 70s. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we know both teams score a ton. We also know both teams not too bad on the defensive side either. But Iowa here in the final four back to back appearances in the hunt for their first national championship. Kylan, we can't wait. For now, we'll send it back to you. Before Purdue hits the floor on Saturday, make sure to tune into the Big Ten Network for the Big Ten Live Final Four pregame. It starts at 4 p.m. Eastern, 3 o'clock Central, with analysis and reports from Arizona and breakdowns of the matchup with NC State. That's Saturday, 4 o'clock Eastern on the Big Ten Network and the Fox Sports app. The Boilers dialing in for a date with NC State on Saturday at State Farm Stadium. Zach Eady looks to continue his domination after dropping 40 in the Elite Eight. Let's head back out to Glendale where Dave Revson, Bruce Weber, and the Andy Katz break down the big man's domination. Kylan, thanks as we continue our coverage here from the desert getting set for Purdue and North Carolina State game one of two on Saturday in the national semifinals. And guys, Zach Eady will be front and center, literally and metaphorically in this game. Edie expected to be named AP Player of the Year later today. It'll be the first of many Players of the Year. He's going to be the first to win back-to-back -back Player of the Year since Ralph Sampson in the early 80s. 
give people a sense of, of the accomplishment of that from Zach Eady and what he has meant here to this Purdue program. Well, it's unbelievable, to be honest. And if you think about it, it's 50 years or so for Purdue to get to the Final Four. It's been 50 years since somebody's won back-to-back. -back. So with Ralph Sampson and those names, you're talking Lou Alcindor, Kareem, you're talking Oscar Robinson. It's, it's just amazing. His consistency. Credit to their staff in his development because he was not a highly retouted guy yes. at all. And how he's developed... But he's, he, you always talk about the physical part, you talk about the skill, but he also has the intellect, and he's learned how to play. He's so consistent, and I, I, I'm just amazed how he has played and continued to get better. Well, and I think it's unfair that he has not been recognized for this greatness. You know, people think, oh, he's boring, all this kind of garbage. I mean, the list that you said you can add Jerry Lucas and Oscar Robertson and Pete Maravich and Bill Walton, I mean, it's a Hall of Fame list that have done what he is going to do this weekend with all these awards winning back to back and he put an exclamation point on that elite eight performance with 40 and 16. if he goes out here has another great performance saturday and then monday wins it he better get the recognition he deserves because he will now, be why do you up think on it's not getting the recognition you're, you're just saying that people criticize the salad play a little bit i don't think there's been enough of appreciation of what he has accomplished yeah. in the last two years and it may be some distance from this, uh, and maybe people get clouded by NBA careers of the names I just rattled off, but they had great college careers. I mean, in my mind, regardless what happens this weekend, he's a college basketball Hall of Famer. Yeah, yeah. college basketball. Oh, Hall impossible of Famer. to argue. Well, but I mean, that. you know, I mean, right. he, I'm telling you right now, I think he needs to be whenever they do that years from now. What he's accomplished in these years at Purdue. You know, I had a chance growing up. I was a Bucks fan. I grew up in Milwaukee. I watched Kareem. And it was so easy. They just threw it to him and he shot 12-foot hooks and they swished every time. And as a, as a fan, I think you don't appreciate how that skill to do that and what Zach has done. It's just, it, it is amazing to me. His consistency, he comes, he comes to play. He, he's, got, he's good on defense, too. And, and it's not like they have superstars around him. They have very good players. But, you know, he is the guy. Right, and I think what's so amazing about it, too, is it's the hard work he's put in, and that's what you were talking about with the staff. And when you do a Purdue game, you see that. You see in the shoot-around him going through his routine, the lefty hooks, the righty hooks, every move that he could possibly have to make in the low post, he's working on with incredible repetition before the game. And it kind of speaks to the coaching as well. And so for Matt Painter, someone you know extremely well, someone that was on your staff, someone that you recruited what an amazing accomplishment this is for him. And I think we finally will see him considered now in that pantheon that we all believed mm -hmm. he belonged in among the elite coaches in college basketball. Yeah, there's no doubt. I was really disappointed, to be honest, that he wasn't he wasn't even in the final ballot for the coach of the year, national coach of the year. You know, it, it's kind of funny because, and again, I think it goes back with, oh, they got the big guy, they just score. It's not, but he's got a group of guys he's put together. He's done it his way. He's got Indiana kids, and he's figured out how to get the ball to Zach at the right times in the right places. And, you know, he has done a, a great, great job. He's changed. He's been flexible. Coach Katie told us years ago, if you want to stay in this business, you have to change. The game changes, life changes, and Matt has kept up with it. And when he told me that yesterday about how they brought in an analytical guy, say, okay, what are we doing wrong? Why are we losing to these teams early in the NCAA tournament? And they said, during the season, you're not doing anything wrong. You've had these outlier games. But they have always been defensive-oriented. And Robbie Hummel was telling us about this. I was all focusing on defense. But they made a switch absolutely going to being much more of an offensive team. That was part of the reason in getting Lance Jones, making sure Zach got the ball more. Braden Smith has become much more of an offensive player. And so thinking like that, they've changed the way they're approaching the game, and it's been successful. I think one of the obvious differences this year is you go from 288th in the nation in three-point percentage to second. You don't need an analytics expert to tell you that's a vast improvement, particularly with the way that the game is played in this day and age. But I do think it's interesting, right? Like defense lives here. That was the mantra of Purdue basketball. You look at the final four in this grouping in the NCAA tournament. They are first among these four in offensive efficiency. 
They're third in defensive efficiency. Now, part of that is the fact that UConn's defense <laughs> has been impenetrable yes. so far in the NCAA tournament, but it does speak to a, a change in philosophy. And again, if you can be as adaptable as that as a coach, you're going to win a lot of games, which is exactly what Matt Painter has done. Plenty more of our coverage as we continue here from Glendale, but let's send it back to Kylan. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. The big men getting some shine ahead of the Purdue NC State Final Four. A lot of talk about the matchup between DJ Burns Jr. and Zach Eady, who've both been really good this postseason. However, just look at Eady's numbers. They jump off the page, <laughs> averaging 30 points, 16 rebounds per game in the postseason. Just ridiculous. And by the way, Edie adding another trophy to his case as if he needs another one, but still the accolades keep rolling in for the Purdue big man. He was named the AP Player of the Year for the second straight season. He's now one of just eight players in the history of college basketball, Ray Fell, with 900-plus mm. points and 450-plus rebounds in a single Crazy. season. Everything he's doing, just ridiculous. It's hard to put it into words. But when you watch Zach Eady, I mean, actually, to me, I want to say that I think the most impressive part about Zach Eady is the fact that he didn't start playing basketball until his sophomore year of high school. Yep. He played baseball and hockey <laughs> yep. growing up in Canada. Uh, I mean, so the fact that he started there at 15 years old and is now here as a two-time national player of the year, right. uh, I mean, where do you rank him on your Mount Rushmore of all-time great college basketball players? Oh, man. That's a good question. I would say he's up there. I would say Zach Eady is the best player to ever play at Purdue. And I, when I think of the best players who ever play at Purdue, I think of Rick Mount. I think of Big Dog, Glenn Robinson. And I think those guys have a shot at being on the Mount Rushmore. So when you look at Zach Eady, I put him there with those great guys. You look at the season he's had, 900 points, 450 rebounds. That hadn't been done since Larry Bird. I think we look at Zach Eady and we watch him in real time and we see his size and we don't appreciate what he's doing on the floor. We don't appreciate what he's given us as fans of college basketball. He's having one of the better seasons that we've ever seen in college basketball. He's dominant on the block. He's making his free throws. He runs the floor. You think of that Tennessee game. He played 39 minutes in the game. He's 7'4". He's close to 300 pounds. He's able to play every single minute in the basketball game and be effective. I love what Zach Eady's presented, and not just on the floor. It's been in the locker room. I look at this Purdue team. I've been in every Purdue locker room since back in 2009, since the baby boilers days. This is the best locker room that they've had. There's no clicks on the team. There's no freshmen just hanging out with freshmen or transfers hanging out with transfers, seniors just going to the bars and the freshmen going to the frats. When these guys are doing something, they're doing it as a team. When they have a decision, they're doing it as a team. And when your best player is buying in, when your best player is your hardest worker, when your best player is your leader in the locker room, that extra coach, these are the results you get. Zach Eady's been sensational. You look at his freshman, sophomore year, played 14 minutes a game as a freshman, split time as a sophomore. These last two years, he's just been nothing but dominant. Zach Eady played 39 minutes of that game against That's Tennessee crazy. in the Elite Eight. A seven-footer with that type of conditioning. I mean, I think it's hard. What at this point can people complain about in terms of him being an NBA draft lottery pick? No, it's not. Improve the defense. Playing. I mean, yes. maybe I guess outside shooting. Is that what's missing? I mean, you think about it, but you look at his size, his ability to rebound the basketball, rebound out of his area, that gives him something. He's a rim protector. You see Don Connect drive into the lane. Don Connect is an NBA-level talent. He drives to that basket thinking he's going to get himself to. Zach Eady goes vertical, blocks the shot, saves the game. He can bring that to the next level. He can run the floor and put pressure on defense. He can guard a ball screen. He can play the drop coverage. He can ice it on the side of it. I love what Zach Eady presents. I think he's a big man in the right situation with a team that believes in him and believes that what he brings to the floor is valuable. I think he could be a guy that not just gets drafted into the NBA, plays in the NBA. I think Zach Eady's going to stick in the NBA and be productive. All right, let's switch gears back to the NC State matchup coming up on Saturday night. We talked a little bit about DJ Burns, Zach Eady, how we expect that to play out inside. But how about the backcourt play? DJ Horn leads this Wolfpack team in scoring more than 40% from beyond the arc. Do you expect Lance Jones to be the matchup there? And what's the defensive game? I, I want Braden Smith to take the matchup. Okay, I want it because he's a point guard that should match up, guard your matchup. But I mm -hmm. think Lance Jones will take the matchup. And I look at DJ Horn. He is a bucket. He is a guy you think Jameer Young, you think Tyson Walker, you think Boo Booey. He fits right into that category as somebody that can just flat out score the basketball. He can knock down threes. He can get to the basket and finish through contact. He won't be scared of driving the ball against Zach Eady. If he blocks it, he blocks it. DJ Horn is driving it right again. He can make his free throws. He's really good out of a ball screen. 
he makes them go on the offensive end. And when he gets going, it opens up the floor for Marcel, for O'Connell, for Jaden Taylor off of the bench. And when those complimentary guys, when they come in the game and when they make threes, it takes NC State to another level. They're good without making shots. They can get up and down. They'll guard you. But when their perimeter guys are making shots, when they're confident offensively, when they get a third score or a fourth score, that's when NC State is really good. But it starts with DJ Horn. He's definitely the straw that stirs the drink. He gets them going on that end. And he's the best defensively. So I think Brandon Smith, Lance Jones, they're going to have their hands full either way. On the other side for Purdue's offense, NC State plays drop coverage off ball screens yep. when DJ Burns is in the game. Yep. With the way Braden Smith has been able to knock down in the mid-range, get downhill, mm. that looks mm. like it could be a problem. Could Braden Smith be the key for this Boilers offense? Oh, 100% for that reason. That's exactly what I was going to say. Playing a drop coverage against Purdue, it just is not going to work, especially yeah. if you're big, can't move laterally. He doesn't have that lateral quickness because you're going to have Brandon Smith coming to that right hand. I talked to Coach P.J. Thompson the other day. They want Brandon Smith to be aggressive in the ball screen, getting downhill to his right hand, shooting that pull up. If the defense decides to go under, he's going to step back and shoot the three. But his ability to play downhill and put D.J. Burns in the mix, that's going to be a key factor to this game, no doubt about it. I can see Brandon Smith knocking down some 15-footers, getting all the way to the rim. And next thing you know, you start seeing that hook pass to Zach Eady. You insert Mason Gillis into that lineup as a roll and replace guy. Now you got Mason Gillis knocking down shots from three. North Carolina State, I don't think they're going to be able to play drop coverage. What I could see them doing mm -hmm. is downing everything. We had things where we knew a player, if he was really good to his right hand like a Brandon Smith was, I would ask Coach Painter, let's just ice it. Let's just down it. Let's just send everything he's doing to the left side of the floor, rather if it's on the side of the court or rather if it's in the middle of the floor. You can send him left and make Brandon Smith make a decision going that way. I think that would be interesting if they do that. The thing is, defending Purdue in the ball screens, you send someone over to help. You know where Zach Eady's going, yep. straight to the rim, and yep. Braden Smith can get the ball to him. They have that connection. Really tough defensive, you know, going to be a tough defensive uh, assignment for this NC State team. I like Purdue in this matchup. Once again, we yep. keep talking about it inside, in the backcourt. It's looking good for the Boilers. Now they just have to deliver on the big, big stage. Well, one final break here on Big Ten today, and coming up, Iowa's Caitlin Clark and Purdue Zach Eady certainly getting their shine in the postseason, but also getting their fair share of criticism. What a title would mean to their legacies. We're going to talk about that next. No bigger star in college basketball right now than Caitlin Clark. I said it. <laughs> Zach Eady's a big name, but Caitlin Clark is the biggest. And she's got the Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs cheering her on. I mean, <laughs> come on. At the Super Bowl, actually, Patrick Mahomes talked about how much he enjoys watching her play, and he admitted that he doesn't want to face her on the court. She'd probably take him. Yeah, but, I mean, she's being talked about on Radio Row at the Super Bowl. I mean, the star doesn't get much brighter than that. Uh, welcome back into Big Ten Today, presented by Gatorade. Ray fell back with me to talk more about Zach Eady and Caitlin Clark's legacy because these two, as much as they excel on the biggest stage, they also are subject to a lot of criticism that, yeah. in my opinion, isn't fair most no. of the time. When you look at what they've done, going to the Final Four, what would a national title do to maybe silence some of those haters? Oh, it would do everything. It would just silence everybody around the country. Kaylin Clark should go down. It's not just one of the better women basketball players to ever play college basketball, but one of the better college basketball players to ever play the game, just period, right there. Men or women. She gets the job done at a high level. It's not just the way she scores the ball, but the way she shares it, the way she gets her teammates open, the way she makes her teammates better, the confidence she puts in her team. I think you look at Kaylin Clark, champion or not, you've got to put her with the GOATs. You've got to put her right there on Mount Rushmore. But if she wins one with the team she has, the caliber of teammates that she's playing with, you put her above some of those people. Because you look at the great UConn team, some of the better teams that's ever played the, played the game at that level, they had dominant players across the board. I mean, I can remember Diana Taurasi and Sue Bird playing together. And that is just crazy when you think about it. But for what Kaylin Clark has done, it's been special. And Zach Eady on the other side, you look at last season, the number one team in the country, he didn't have another all-conference guy on that team. So you look at it, he was the guy on the team, and everyone thought it was Zach Eady and the Bad News Bears. And that wasn't the case, and that's what we've seen this season. Zach Eady has elevated the play of a Fletcher lawyer. He's elevated the play of Braden Smith, made him an honorable mention All-American. And then he's allowed Lance Jones the safe space to be able to come into Purdue and be himself as a transfer. You look at Zach Eady, you look at Caitlin Clark, what they've done for college basketball this season as far as the numbers, the ratings, the fun.
funds they've brought in, it's just been say sensational. I'm just glad I got to be a part of it. There was actually a take floating around in social media this morning that was said on another program that if Paige Beckers had not gotten hurt, Caitlin Clark wouldn't even be being talked about right now. Crazy. That was the take. To me, totally wrong. Crazy. Caitlin Clark would still be doing what she's doing, which is incredible at Iowa. There's room for two stars in yes. women's college basketball, but what do you make of those types of comments? If I was seven feet five, we wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> right. So what I mean, if you could what if what all if, day? I mean, if, if it was a fifth, you know the saying. So, I mean, it's the thing where all of these scenarios, they make no sense because you look back at pictures from Caitlin in high school. She was right there on the USA team mm -hmm. with Haley Van Lith, with, Kate, with um, Paige Becker. She was competing at that level already. There was room for Caitlin Clark in the sport. There was room for Paige Beckers in the sport. Although injuries came a part of her career, she's still a phenomenal player. I think next season, Paige Becker is going to get all of the spotlight, which I love what she said in her press conference the other day. She wants it to go to multiple players. She wants Juju to get her shine. She wants everyone around women's basketball to get some shine and not just be one person. But I think people get fixated on the being space for one guy I, or one lady. I think Paige, Caitlin, they could have coexisted just like Juju came in this season has been dominant. I think women's basketball, the way it's growing, it just makes me excited that I got a four-year-old daughter. All right, in three words, Zach Eady to the NBA. Why should it happen? Put you on the spot. He can rebound, he can block shots to protect the paint, and he can guard a ball screen and move in space. All right, we got to get that final plug in there. Well, thanks so much for joining us in this edition of Big Ten Today. Stick around all weekend long. A lot of coverage coming up of Purdue and Iowa in the final four.